So welcome to AAM's Communicating Effectively with Non-Vegan Family and Friends. Vegans are frequently challenged to find the right words and style of communication when speaking to family and friends. In this workshop, Claire Mann, world-renowned communication trainer and author of Estopia, will offer tips and strategies for communicating about veganism and uh, animal rights, especially with non-vegan family and friends. We'll have time for Q&A, so please put questions in the chat. Claire will conclude with a guided meditation. So my name is Michelle Granberg. I'm your moderator tonight. I'm a mentor and team member with Animal Activism Mentorship. I'm located in New Jersey, and I've been a vegan and activist for five years. AAM's mission is to build a global community of powerful and effective activists in order to meet our ultimate goal of animal liberation. We do this by matching experienced activists as mentors with aspiring activists as mentees. Activists, mentor, uh, sorry, mentors meet one-on-one -on -one with mentees to share their experience and knowledge with newer activists so they don't feel alone and to inspire them to be more vocal and active. Additionally, we offer free workshops that train and educate our mentors, mentees, and the public on various aspects of veganism and animal rights activism. We're also proud to announce our strategic alliance with Farm, one of the oldest animal rights organizations in the world, Farmed Animal Rights Movement, or FARM. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor or mentee or just want to get involved, please reach out to any AAM mentor or visit our website and follow AAM and FARM on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Clubhouse. Okay, so with that being said, I am very, very excited to welcome back and introduce our prestigious guest speaker, Claire Mann. Claire is an expert in the challenges of being vegan while living in a non-vegan world. And again, after Claire's presentation, we'll open up the Q&A portion and then Claire will wrap up with a guided meditation. So welcome, Claire. Hi. Welcome. Yes, thank you very much. And welcome to everyone. And um, I just hope I can um, deliver on what you're promising. Of <laughs> <laughs> you, you have and you will for certain. And we're just love to have you here because we're, we're one community. We really are. So you're going to talk about communication uh, tonight. Let's start talking about, you know, how to communicate with family and friends. You know, what is it like for vegans to be in a non-vegan family? And what are the, some of the most common issues and dynamics that show up? Wow. <laughs> so how do we begin on that one? It's such a broad topic, isn't it? It's um, the challenges, as we all know. Um, I myself, my immediate partner and my um, animals around me, and um, I, I don't have children, but are all, they're all vegan. But my extended family aren't, and his extended family aren't. And... Um, and that's very challenging, particularly when you share that information, of course. And one thing I've found, Michelle, and you, you may actually have found this yourself, is how difficult it is um, to advocate to family. And there's a reason for that. There's all the family history, conscious and unconscious. Um, your parents knew you before you knew yourself. And it was okay what we did. We brought you up this way. And then suddenly you're going to tell me that everything I did was wrong. And so you've got all those things that stand in the way of people truly being open and to listening to the imperative of veganism. But we can advocate certainly for family, to family, but it's often other, other people that bring them over the line. Not always. Um, but, you know, is that your experience as well, Michelle? Yeah, it's very much my experience. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I always think that that is why I did a video, I think, once or an article. That's mm -hmm. why, you know, street outreach can be so powerful, because when you're showing somebody something, they get to experience that for a moment, their reactions in relation to what we're showing them, which is often footage. Mm -hmm. When we're advocating to a family me method, um, member, all the unconscious stuff happens. So we're talking to our sister or something, and they say something and very subtly and we don't even know we're doing it we just raise our eyebrows or something and that's happened a thousand a million times over the years 
And unconsciously, they're probably registering that too. And so it sets up this sort of dynamic, this sort of pressing of buttons that sort of happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and they think, why are they resisting? When I'm talking to someone else, I don't have that barrier. So I think that's what happens, Michelle, is there's this unconscious history, reactions, nonverbal little changes, even in the, the muscles in the face that tap into all those past experiences and, and unfinished business and everything else we have going on in our family. But it's not impossible, as we know. Um, so could you direct me a little more with a question? What, you know, I want to deliver on what you're actually asking here. No, I, lo- I, lo- I love what you said and in terms of, yeah, people get we get triggered more by our family than anyone else because we have some baggage in regards to that. So, you know, I know there's no perfect words to use, you know, but are there any tips you can offer in terms of like body language and tone and how we communicate and maybe some of the best words, even some examples of, you know, some words that will land better for our family and friends. We're talking to them about the fact that we're vegan. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, um, I've been running communication training for a couple of decades um, in the general sort of world um, and then been able to apply that in the last 10 years. My real focus and desire is to help vegans communicate more effectively so that we all these things don't sort of stand in the way. And I always say to people, we've got to get the foundational uh, principles in play. And the key of that is we've got... The Number one rule in many ways is we've got to learn to challenge our assumptions. Now, those unquestioned expectations, interpretations of what is going on. And we project onto others all this sort of thing. We're doing it all the time. It's like a social shorthand. We see images, we see people. And often in my trainings, I will flash up different, what I call flashcards and just images, you know, uh, a 55 year old man in a red sports car. And you say to people, what comes into your mind? And, and they know it's not really nice, really, but they say, oh, it's a midlife crisis. You know, mm-hmm. these are um, just assumptions. This little filter happens. It's partly cultural, it's partly our time in history, and it's partly ourselves. And then I, I show them different politicians and they, you know, people will have a reaction. I say, all of that is our assumptions. Now, we do that all the time. So when we're talking to someone else, how they behave, their raised eyebrows, their anything they say, any resistance, we assume that we know what's going on. And we hear each other say, don't we? They just don't care. I've shown them all this material and they're just selfish. Now that is often an assumption. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment, but I'll give you some tools. How do we challenge those assumptions? I remember doing some street outreach, um, Michelle, in Sydney, Australia. And I was advocating showing the Dominion footage and it was really gruesome as we know. Um, And somebody stands alongside you, so you're right into the conversation. You don't have to segue in and find a way. And this woman said, what on earth is this? She says, it's terrible. I said, well, actually, um, you're you're seeing where actually our food comes from. Notice that I use the word our food, although I haven't eaten, gosh, I haven't eaten animal flesh meat for over 40 years but I said this is where we get our food from oh my goodness and then I was doing the normal advocacy we do and we'll come back to that a little later and then she said oh my god this is this is absolutely awful now how can we stop it surely this isn't real and I responded in the way we would all respond to say this is normal industrialized systemized cruelty that our well-earned dollars are paying for and, and she said, what can we do about it? And I said, well, that's the good news. <laughs> and so I moved her into that conversation with a solution. And she said, oh, I'm going to have to think about this. Now, how many of us have heard that? And you go, how is it possible? I've just shown you this footage. You're horrified by it. You've got a visceral reaction. So we've made an emotional connection with the suffering. I tell you there's a solution. And then you're going to say, oh, I need to think about it. How easy it would have been for me, Michelle, to say, what a selfish woman. She's just hard. She likes the taste of meat or whatever. But I withheld that assumption. And I asked, what is it that is stopping you, you know, taking the solution so that you're not contributing to the suffering? And she said, oh, my gosh. She said, I'm I'm Italian. I'm part of a big Italian family. She said, they already have, um, they don't feel I sort of, I'm, I don't cook as well for my husband in the traditional ways. And they, every time I see my mother-in-law, there's this resistance and rejection because I'm not doing what was always the traditional food. 
my marriage is on the rocks and mm. now I'm going to go home and say, oh, we're not going to be angels anymore. She said, it's too much. She said, and so how, the, here's the principle, is she's not a selfish woman. For her, it, it's a whole shift in her lifestyle. And she's just walked along in the shopping mall and now her life's about to just change, her marriage will be over, family going to kick her out. She has to think about where she takes her children. Can you see what I'm saying? Is... And I said, well, the challenge you have now is that you can't unknow what's happened and it'll be a matter of time. But for you to align your actions with what you're experiencing, you know, mm -hmm. you have to take the solution. You have to no longer eat, wear, or be part of this. She said, I know this. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, let us help you. Let us take you on that journey. And I was able to, to move her to the right direction. So assumptions, Michelle, this is the key thing. So all of us make assumptions. We jump to conclusions. We don't even know we're doing it. OK, and so if we can hold that back and one of the golden rules, Michelle, is question, question, question. OK, and we don't ask enough questions. We ask one or two and then we give advice usually. And note that I said, what is it that stops you doing this? If I had asked her why, try to avoid the use of the word why. Why gives a defensive response. OK, Michelle, um, why didn't you come to my party on Saturday? Now, if we're friends and you knew you could have made a little bit more effort and you value our friendship and you think you're going to be judged, you're going to lay it on thick, all the excuses, you have this terrible migraine and you miss the bus and everything else, not because you're a pathological liar, it's because you don't want our friendship to be affected, that you didn't take the time. If I ask you a different question, hey, Michelle, we had a great time on Saturday. I really missed you. What happened? Can you see how the energy is different? Mm -hmm. I'm not judging you. You go, oh, Claire, I'm so sorry. I knew I should have called you. I felt awful. And because I'm not judging you. So the use of the word why, unless it's really information giving, is like, why are we doing Tuesday and not Thursday? It's try to turn your whys into what's. So that's right. definitely be. So question, and we can really, I can give lots of examples of how we might do that. And how, when, where, um, and give me an example. These are better ones than actually why. <laughs> you know, how important is it, you're going to say very, to manage our own emotions when we're talking to people? And how do we do that? How, I mean, is there a tip you have for that to manage our own emotions? Because we, the reason communication goes awry is because we get so emotional over this topic. Oh, yes. And I really wish you were fly on the wall on Sunday when I had a conversation with someone who did that. That one that really presses our buttons, Michelle, is um, we're superior to animals and the animals are giving up their lives for us. <laughs> Whoa, I could feel this all rising up within me. So, you know, we don't want to reach a time, do we, when it doesn't bother us and we calmly respond because we're going to have that response. And um, but let, it's when, uh, number one it's absolutely essential. And there's a number of reasons for this. OK, so. Number one, what are emotions? You know, emotions are really what our bodies make of our thoughts, <laughs> or that's our feelings, our, and they're there. I always see them as they provide a swathe of color over an otherwise logical black and white sort of world, logic, rationale, facts and figures. And they show the significance and the importance of, of what we're dealing with. So we often feel very angry as vegans, and we have a lot to be angry about. And anger, I see, is when something we um, value so much is being violated, you know, cruelty to animals. So it's mm. perfectly justified. But some, I'd like to share a bit of neuroscience, if I wait, may with you, Michelle, because if we re truly get this, we'll realize that we can bring ourselves physiologically and neurologically to a state that has the better chance of them leaning forward and actually listening to us. And if we don't do it, the opposite happens. And they go, oh, don't tell me. OK, and how we do that, we're going to do it through practice. So I wonder if there's any neuroscientists in the room. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> oh, and I usually say I'm so pleased because I'm not a neuroscientist either, but I do know a lot about neuroscience. Now, <laughs> to do this, I've got to tell you a story. OK, I want each of you to think about who was your favorite teacher at school. Now, hopefully you've got a favorite teacher. Michelle, can I ask you? Who was your favorite oh, teacher? Oh, I had a favorite teacher in uh, first grade. Her name was Mrs. Allweather. 
Yep. And um, I, I loved her so much, mostly because I just remember she was just very warm and very caring. And I just imagine her speaking up at the front of the room and being very, very engaging to all of us kids. Absolutely. And I bet you she felt you felt safe. You didn't feel victimized or you weren't there weren't favorite. She was kind. She made you feel OK, good, cared for. Lovely. And mine was Miss Andrews when I was five years old. And um, she just took those children that had just left mum and taken into the school. And she just had that beautiful soft landing. Now, what about a teacher? Let's think of us for a moment. Who was a teacher you didn't like? Michelle, do you have one? Yeah, I do. I, I Someone comes to mind there as well. And you're right. She was, her communication was harsh. She was a little mean. She was a little short. She was a little punitive, I remember her being, and I was intimidated by her. And that was third grade or fourth grade. Well, that's right. So it's how she made you feel. Her actions resulted in something, how you felt like that. You um, didn't feel safe. You felt they were probably favorites. You felt judged. You felt hard to open your mouth at things. Okay, now she um, affected how that was. Now, colleagues of mine in Melbourne, Australia, have done research in both the UK and in Australia in schools with young children. And they take two sets of teachers, both self-selected, all of them professionals doing a great job presenting in a formal, exactly the same material and with a smile on their face. But the teachers put their hand up to say either that they absolutely love what they're doing despite all the admin, despite all the challenges and problems. And the others say, we really are over it. It's too much admin. I work in a really difficult area. I wanted to go in for teaching, but I really don't get to see the children and have as much autonomy. But in other words, they were self-selected, those that love their jobs and those that didn't. But both, all of them had to be, in terms of their assessments of their performance, um, not by the students, but by the, the, what the delivery, they were delivering, they actually were all doing a great job. And they trained them to present specific classes in exactly the same format, but each of them had self-selected. And they found that the children that were in the classes where the teacher wanted to be there and love what they were doing, and they were the sort of teachers you talk about, Michelle, that, that your favorite, the children in that, that class performed better academically. They cooperated more, their attention spans were more, they um, didn't have as much conflict with each other. The, the children, and they did massive number of trials across these two countries. The children that were in the other class that didn't, with the teacher that didn't want to be there but wasn't giving it away, they were playing around, their attention span was less, they were making a noise, throwing rubbers and rulers everywhere, and they didn't perform as well. Now, what was the difference? Because they were performing on the face of it exactly the same. When they actually um, linked the, they did studies of their brain, which they did at the same time, they found that the teachers that wanted to be there, their blood had flown to the front of the brain, the front of the cortex, we call the blue zone, but the children had all gravitated to the blue zone as well. In the other class, the teacher, her or his blood was at the back of the brain, the fight or flight area, where a lot of adrenaline gets pumped out. We're in conflict. We have arguments. We're reacting to people. We're in road rage mode sort of thing. Do you know, all those children were shot and gravitated to the back of the brain. They were quite young children, seven, eight, nine or so. So they weren't so in charge of their own managing their own emotions. But... So what we know is that when the blood flows to the back of the brain, when this lady said to me the other day, God has made us a little higher than the animals and I thank them for giving up their lives. Whoa, you know, we feel that surge of cortisol um, and adrenaline go and I, whoa, you know, and I could have said something very harsh and I was aware of what was happening. Okay, what we have to do and what I had to do and I've done with practice through meditation and visualization, we have to bring our blood to the front of the brain, okay? Because then we influence that person too. So if we get into the argument, and bear in mind, they're going to do the same to us. When they say something like that, or well, you can't tell me what to do, you're being mm -hmm. a preachy vegan, they can influence to, us to move away from the front of our brain. And we can't gather the facts, figures, logic, open-mindedness, okay? Now, what they also found is that those teachers used empathic listening skills. They asked questions, they paraphrased, they reflected, they showed empathy to the other person. In the teacher that didn't, they were short, as you say, they were very short and curt and, and, and did, did that. So 
how do we bring our blood to the front of the brain? There's techniques we can do to do that, literally to visualize, slow our breathing down. Mm -hmm. When we slow our breathing down, like in yoga, the out breath activates the parasympathetic nervous system that brings us into alignment. Our sympathetic nervous system, you know, we press the button and it's sympathetic to the fact that we're under attack or what we believe is under attack. Blood goes to the back of the brain, we're ready to fight or flight. So, but we also found this in organizations, Michelle. So the type of people we like as managers, they use empathic listening skills. Okay. They, and that doesn't mean just being quiet and listening. We interact to show that we are understanding. We're open to their perspective. And we can give, I can give lots of examples of this. Big part of it is challenging our assumptions and asking questions. So I hope that gives you a little bit more of a context, Michelle, is if, so in other words, if we're talking to someone and we feel our heckles rise and we try to pretend that we're smiling and open-minded, we take a deep breath, but we are really wanting to go for the jugular, we will influence them to, to react. It's magic really, Michelle, because it means that we have much greater control over facilitating their readiness to hear what is very difficult information. I love that. And I would love for, you know, those who are in our audience, if you have any communication tips that you have used that work for you, go ahead and put those in the chat. And again, any questions for Claire for later on when we get to our uh, Q&A portion um, in terms of what you would like to know. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm sure many people like myself, as, as much as we have good intentions, sometimes we lose it with family and friends, right? And we do despite ourselves, wind up getting in an argument or a really heated discussion. And, and I, I read that feeling of that, that, that inner heat that comes. And then I fumble for my words. I can't get my center back. So, you know, what, what are ways to, let's say you've already had that heated discussion or argument. You can't take it back. What do you recommend going forward? You know, what can you say or do going forward to make it Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I think we smell inauthenticity off a mile, a mile off. <laughs> Being real with people, and this is relevant not just for activism, it's for, you know, our relationships with our nearest and dearest, our mother-in-laws, our next door neighbors. These are good communication skills. So being real with people. So it depends really, Michelle, whether you're in the moment of it happening or it's happened and you feel this awful tension that happens. Um, and then so you're going to be able to come back to that. So let's have a look at the one where you're in the moment. To understand that, I think we've got to understand the difference between what I call process and content. Okay? There's two things going on in all conversations and really all relationships, I suppose. But let's take a conversation. Is the content is the facts, the figures. The, you are sharing information with people what happens in the animal agriculture industry. Okay, you, you're telling them what happens, the methods, the imperatives, whatever, it's the information. The process is like the dynamics, the undercurrents, the raised eyebrows, the heated voices, the judgments, the things that we, or the implied judgments, or our assumptions that we think that are selfish people that, you know, don't want to listen. Um, all of these are make up that dynamic thing. And there's sometimes times when we say something, often sarcastic or something, totally understandable because of the outrageous things people say um because let's be honest here michelle we should tell them one tiny minuscule amount of what we know and they should become vegan right away there's no there's no argument here and we can't believe that they take so long and there's reasons for that we can come back to okay so say you're in the middle of a conversation and then you say something like oh well enjoy your ill health then or something we say something or you're just a horrible person if you can, I, when you say that is, or you start to get angry with them, you pick up what you've said. In other words, that's a process issue. You slip from the information to try to sort of prod them and wake them up from this trance, this psychosis, mm. really. This, um, but we've got to admit to that. So say I'm in the middle of a conversation and I would say to someone, I start to get angry and my voice is heated and I say, oh, you know, how can you say that? It's just ridiculous thing you're going to say. And we all do it sometimes. Or you... Use a bit of sarcasm. It's okay. Well, well, you do think we're more higher than the animals. Hey, how is that working for us? You know, we do this sort of, <laughs> it's perfectly justified, is catch it right away. And I go, whoa, gosh, gosh, I just heard myself speak, Michelle. 
I am so sorry. <laughs> okay, I really, oh, I try to put the knife in there and I apologize that for that. However, what I don't apologize for, Michelle, is the information I'm sharing with you. Because I know that when you and I know this, we are fully informed and good people like, you know, yourself and others will not want to be part of that. Mm. You see what I mean? You're staying in your integrity. You apologize for being mean and actually laying it on as if it's all their fault. But I use those words is I apologize for that. However, what I don't apologize for is. Mm-hmm. And I think it then there's something about repeating that because then we're not defending ourselves. But you're saying, look, you know, it's it's I've I've used unfair fairness here. And I say and I'll be honest with you, what I know is so intense. And I know that when you see it, you will be equally horrified. And so will 99 percent of the population. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's why I'm so spirited about this because, you know, I can, you know, the injustice of this is so great and the suffering. Okay, so you bring that into the moment. Does that make sense? I'll come back to the one, maybe you want to make a comment or someone else does. Um, I'll come back to the one where we've got to go back in the conversation. Yeah, so is, is there ever a time when it's better to set a really strong boundary with friends and family or even walk away from a friendship or a family member, like all together, when would that be the case? Well, each of us have got to be, um, to identify what is right for us. And um, one of the side effects of being vegan is um, that we're gonna lose friends because the intimacy goes. What we used to do with people, the friendly exchanges, when they tell us about their new marble top kitchen, you know, and you think, really, this is so trivial to do with what I'm doing on Saturday. It all seems so trivial, doesn't it, Michelle? <laughs> and yet before you might like going dress shopping with a girlfriend and you might still like that occasionally, but it has to be on top of all this activism because you're thinking, oh, this is a bit of a break we're having to resource ourselves. But in and of itself, it all seems so mm-hmm. trivial, doesn't it? And so each of us have to decide, but also because this is it views the foundation of our lives, the whole philosophy of how we live. It's going to be very difficult to, and each of us have to decide, can we eat in the presence of other people eating animals? Mm-hmm. Can we, you know, go out with a girlfriend who buys a cashmere sweater? And um, we might say something, but can we do that? I'm going to put my hand up. I can't do that. Okay. I do not choose not to eat in the presence of other people um, that eat animals. So, and I, but I make it clear to them is, you know, it's, and I, I think one of the ways to soften, i.e. to not give them the opportunity to say, you're a preachy judgmental person, I've got my choices, and all the non- laundry list of what we hear. I say to them, I'm sorry, I can't come to your barbecue because um, it's very nice of you to in, in invite me, love to spend some time with you if that's the case. However, I'm not able to do that with, with the food you're serving because, the reason, you know, what I know of where that comes from, I just want to sit and cry. Yeah. So it's all about me and my reactions as opposed to them being a bad person. Okay. So, but that would be within context that they probably know I'm vegan. Um, but these days, before, nobody would invite me to that. And, um, been ejected from clubs that would have me as a member, I guess. Because <laughs> I say, but there is that. Um, and it's like going back to family and, and saying, I'm sorry, I can't go back for Thanksgiving. That's what you're going to do. Um, mm. Because it makes me want to cry. Yeah. Oh, we'll have this lovely vegan meal for you. Now, some people can do that. And, you know, I know there's, you know, colleagues of mine, friends of mine, like James Aspie, people would know James. Mm. He thinks it's a really good thing that you can be around other people. It's a chance to advocate. But for many of us, we can't do that. For me, I feel I'm kind of condoning it. If there was something like, you know, you wouldn't put up with if you knew about child abuse and someone was in that industry, you wouldn't say, well, it's their choice. You know, I'll just sit here and not do that and not buy a T-shirt from a sweatshop that, you know, has child labor. And mm-hmm. um, we would say, no, I'm not going to do that. They are advocating selling these T-shirts that poor children are working in an industry. For me, it's the same thing. But, you know, each of us have to decide, um, don't we, Michelle? Now, it's also very difficult for young vegans. You know, if you're somebody living at home with your family, what do you do? You know, and that's very difficult. So often, you know, if you're able to tolerate that and to, you know, and use other opportunities to advocate. Mm. Um, I, I've got quite a, a hard line in many ways. I had a girlfriend recently um, say to me, you know, gosh, you know, you came round to my place. They were all vegans and they had some non-vegans there. 
And um, the woman turned up with a carton of cow's milk. And my friend got really upset. I didn't see it happen because I, I really could not have kept my mouth quiet. You know, it wasn't my problem. And I would have done it. And I, I can share with you, Michelle, if you'd like, how I would have dealt with that. But I, um, she said, what can I do? And I said, we always go back to the, the ethical issues. And she came, but she also knows that my friend is, is vegan and they're advocates. And we, you know, we do vigils on animal experimentation. She's very well aware of this and that the food was beautiful and there were all different types of milk. And all my friend was asking is for her to come and have a different milk in her coffee on that one occasion or on other things. So it wasn't asking her to change her life. And I saw that because of the history of what was going on. It's a bit of a passive aggressive saying, I'm going to have my milk. And so, um, I would have taken, I said, well, really, you need to ring your friend up and say, hey, nice to see you on Saturday. Thank you for coming. However, there's an issue I need to talk to you about. Okay. I'd like to, is this now a good time? Note that I'm asking the person for permission to have the conversation. Neurologically, when somebody says yes, they give us permission in one way because they could say no. And also you get their attention. So they don't sort of bail out after 10 minutes telling you've got, got a meeting to go to. All right, so I need to talk to you about something and say, hello, it was really great to see you the other day. Um, and I know you enjoyed the food. Um, and yeah, I noticed that you, you know, brought the cow's milk and it, it was pretty shocking to me for the reasons that we've already talked about. Um, and I didn't say anything. And I realized that's sitting with me very uncomfortably. And I need to tell you that actually moving forward, it's not okay to do that. Um, because I know the suffering that goes into that. Um, and then I said, stop. And it depends what she then says. Okay, so you've thanked her for a friendship. We had a great time. You know, I noticed she did that. I'm going to own the fact that I should have said something I didn't. And I'm saying it now because it doesn't sit well with me. Why doesn't it sit well with me? Not because you're not doing as you're told at my house, because I know what goes into this and I cannot sanction this. And um, she has had that conversation. The woman said, yeah, but my husband likes the thing. Yeah, I get that. However, when we come into my house, you know, no dead animals actually come into my house and no dead animals leave unless they, you know, they passed on. <laughs> and if the person says, well, I can't do that and say, well, that would be really unfortunate. However, I cannot condone the suffering that goes into the production of what is effectively mammary secretions and the suffering of that for nothing more inconsequential in, in than our taste buds. Note that I keep saying are, even though my friend doesn't use it. R softens things. It's not you're a bad person, I'm good. R as the human race who have been duped into drinking the reproductive secretions of other animals. How bizarre is crazy as that? Okay, so that was an opportunity to go back. So does that give a little bit of food for thought, Michelle? Or? Yes, no, no pun intended, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <there we> go. <laughs> I want to, I want to, everybody's leaving such wonderful uh, comments and they're sharing their experiences in the chat. Somebody mentioned the liberation pledge. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I wanted to ask you, you know, the holidays are coming up um, and here in, in America, it's Thanksgiving, Christmas, et cetera. And those are extra stressful. Do you have any, you know, we get so many invitations and the focus is the meal. So what do you recommend to manage the holidays for vegans? Absolutely. So a number of things. Now you have to decide beforehand, can you tolerate being in the presence of other people when a member of your family is on the table? Okay. And if you can, that's not, there's no judgment there, nor should there be, you know, um, your presence eating the vegan meal is making a major statement in and of itself. Because if Michelle is able to do that and sit there and do that, say for instance, she is able to tolerate the potential ridicule and judgment and why am I different than everybody else? At some level, they will register. There must be something Michelle really feels strongly about here for her to, to be ejected potentially from the family. So in and of itself, that is a form of advocacy. I wish I could do that. I just can't. I used to when I was vegetarian, it didn't kind of matter. And we all know the reasons why that wasn't such an issue. Okay. So, um, You've got that situation. So you've got to start. And then, then there's people that can't go at all. We'll look at that in the moment. So look at the first one. So you're going to be there. People are going to say, oh, what, what are you eating? Um, I, uh, I say, oh, this is a beautiful, you know, avocado dish or, or whatever it is. Um, I never say I'm vegan. Okay. Because there's such a connotation around vegan. Okay. If I don't actually say that. Oh, and people, I say, we will eat something. I say, no, I don't eat animals. 
But if you're in the middle of the meal, as Dr. Will Tuttle says of the World Peace Diet, it's probably the only action we have eating that takes all our senses into account. Mm -hmm. Taste, smell, touch, sound. All these memories of walking with dad at the far, sorry, at the fairground, having a hot dog. All of that comes to play and all this social thing and, and nurturing in the family. I know we have a lot of bad experiences, some people do as well. But, and then we're suddenly going to bring in all the stuff we know. It's not the time. I, I don't discuss these issues over when people are eating. It's, mm. uh, and I say, well, I would say, yeah, it's a thing. Oh, you a vegan? And, I, and I'd say, well, this, what do you understand by vegan? Never answer the question, are you vegan? <laughs> because you assume that they really know and they go, oh, you're one of those fussy vegetarians. But actually, it's not. It's actually someone whose life is imbued with the philosophy of non, non used and exploitation of animals. Oh, so you, you don't eat this and go, hey, look, you know, we're all here for Thanksgiving and I'm, I love being with all these different friends. Maybe that's a conversation we could have later. I'd love to pick you up and explain a little bit of you know, why I've made this choice. You see what I mean? You're, you move, but to actually, but they've got you right in the conversation. So it's like, are you vegan? If you do a yes or no, it's end of the conversation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you would decide to be there and, um, and you, when they say, oh my gosh, look at all that rabbit food, okay? And go, oh, don't you eat any rabbit food? Don't you have lettuces and vegetables and all that stuff? Never eating a banana sandwich? You know, it's that sort of, you know, and making light of it, because often they're not pathologically horrible people. In fact, usually they're not by any means. They just either see you as having a fussy diet or they have an illusion of what a vegan is. Preachy people that stop the traffic with all the billboards. <laughs> OK, so don't have the conversation of lunch. If you can have the make sure there is definitely something for you to eat if you're going to go down that path and have the conversation beforehand. Um, you know, and, and avoid the conversation in the time there. Um, one way I would probably deal with that is emotionally is say to yourself, all the animals being served at that dinner table are actually individually out of suffering. Now. They've passed. Now, I know that's hard for us because we know what, what this industry is, but, but in and of itself, at that moment in time, and a bit of advocacy you can do is not be, be the vegan you wish you had met before you became vegan. <laughs> mm. Be the person who, don't give them the excuse of being a preachy, sullen, irritated sort of person who is perfectly justified in that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Don't give them the excuse to not to have to engage at some level to find out the consequences of their choices. So make the conversation afterwards. I'd love to explain a little bit of why I've chosen this and share you my story with you. Not share why you should become a vegan. Although I don't think, you know, you're all advocates here, we probably wouldn't say that. Because that's about changing them. Let me share my story. So if they turn you down, it's because they're not interested in you. How rude is that? <laughs> you see? So you, you twist that little bit. So we then got the other one, haven't we, Michelle, where you decide not to do it is, um, and that's where somebody invites you to it and you go separate the friendship. If you want to be friends with us or it's your family and, you know, to celebrate some good things. There's been some really challenging couple of years at the moment, as we know, and it's part of ongoing. Uh, on top of the normal things we, we suffer with is people want to come together. They want to put their hair down. They want to celebrate their families. Okay. And all the good things that are happening in life. They just haven't expanded that window of empathy and awareness to include animals at the moment. So if you can't do that and you're a person that can't sit in the presence because you break your heart is you, you take the person, the host away and uh, the hostess and say, hey, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to celebrating with you. However, I'm not going to have to be I can't be there for the meal. And I really want to tell you why, because, um, you know, I don't want this. It's not about judging you or your friends because I just I want to be there and I will be there. I'll come for coffee afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the homework I've done and because of what I know and what is kept from everybody on that table, by the way, <laughs> right, is, is the suffering behind it makes me just want to cry. And I don't want to come to your party and sit there and cry, okay, and be heartbroken. And I know you would be if you knew what I do. And I'm, oh, can't you just come and we'll set you down the end and that sort of thing and say, yes, I could. But, you know, I'm really, I don't want to spoil your party and everything you're doing to celebrate these great people that are coming. Uh, but I'd love to join for dessert. You may be able to do that, for instance, rather than seeing the turkey on the table. Um, and say, so I'd love to, you know, so you can do it like that. Um, there's no easy way to give people a difficult message, is there? Um, 
very challenging. Very challenging. It's, it's very challenging. It's easier when we talk about it here in our little bubble, you know, and to give these examples. But when you're face to face, toe to toe, nose to nose, it's it's definitely challenging. So, given that, why is it so important to have a community of like-minded people who share your values, like us? Yeah, no, absolutely. We need to find our tribe, don't we? To I think we doing this alone is very very difficult. And often vegans say, well, I only really feel uh, comfortable in front of other vegans. And activists say, well, I only, actually only feel from, comfortable in front of activists. Because let's be honest, the, um, I mean, safe company, I think here, Michelle, becoming vegan is a minimum we can do. <laughs> um, is in the sense of all we're doing is coming back to ground zero. We're stopping taking what is not ours. Yeah. I have a dog drinking, um, I have Cosmo in the background drinking water. So people can hear a lot of lapping. It's, that's a beautiful. Um, <laughs> That's a beautiful sound. <laughs> yeah, and he's hopping around because he's got a cast on his leg. He's torn a ligament, as I, I explained to you, running out of <laughs> kangaroos. Never catch them, but <laughs> he's very much Australian. Being a vegan <laughs> is the least we can do, and we just come back to ground zero. However, some people, that's where they're at. All of us have to do something, though. Being that person who is an example by their own life for change is in and of itself very powerful. Okay, and I think it's important that we don't judge other people on that one. Um, I push them a bit, you know, maybe you need to wear a t-shirt, maybe you need to share a meme, maybe you need to uh, do a little bit more. Um, if you can bear to tolerate the potential of being ejected and ridiculed and pushed aside, if the animals can be subjected to what they're subjected to, um, we can certainly learn to do that. And that's why we're all here, of course, we want to take action. And that's right. And thank you. we don't want to be the people, do we, Michelle, that one day they look at us and go, you knew Michelle and you didn't tell me. I had to yeah. find out myself. I didn't know you were a vegan. You see mm. what I mean? It's, um, we don't want to be those people, do we? Okay. Mm. So a community is absolutely essential because we can learn from each other. We're bouncing ideas over. I can see someone saying the volume's so low. There's kind of nothing we can do. I've got a good mic here, but it's a bit close. If you know at your end, I'll, I'm going to holler. Um, you know, we, we need those other people to bounce off ideas. Social support is absolutely essential. But it's very important that we don't move into what I call prolonged wound sharing, <laughs> like a wound, like a cut. Mm. You know, we've got to say, gosh, can you believe what happened on Thanksgiving? You know, and I've shared the story of what happened to me at the weekend of the person that said, you know, God made, her, made us higher than the animals, you know, and those sort of things. And, um, and emphatically said, you know, they thanked the, animal, the person for it is we'll come back to that if we want to look at how I responded. But. We need to be able to share that with other people. And then what we can do for each other, we need to move to each other to solutions. Okay, so what could we have done differently? How could we have responded differently? You might say to a friend, how can you, when you're so upset and you burst into tears at, at um, dinner and you ran out of the room at Thanksgiving, you know, let's look at how we can deal with that. What, what's the conversation you need to have with mum? Okay, so that you don't apologize for bursting into tears. You say, I'm sorry, I spoiled your party. However, you know, I, I need to share with you why I was so upset. You know, it's, um, and then mum says, well, you can't expect everyone to do what you do <laughs> and go, no, mum, I can't. However, what I, I think we can expect is that I share the plight of animals who are the consequence of other people's choices. And most of the people on the table, mum, all of them probably don't know really what goes on. And until mm -hmm. they do, they are not making informed choices and they'll never see the seriousness enough to actually not do it anymore. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one last question before we go to our Q&A and open it up for others. Um, you know, we know that talking to friends and family is different than doing outreach. So, you know, how do you and how important is it to confront and hold accountable the public when we're doing outreach? And what are some tips for that? Yeah, absolutely. We do have to keep people accountable. Um, and when often all we see resistance, like, um, you know, it, it, the reactions of, oh my God, that's awful, but it doesn't happen in Australia or it doesn't happen in America, or that's just a few bad apples and, the, you know, there's wonderful standards, you know, um, and they try to make all the excuses and understandably so, because when you've just seen the horror of that, which is hidden in plain sight, they have been duped. So they're having lots of emotional reactions see that emotion and defensiveness is means you've got to them the information has got to them okay when they go 
I don't care. <laughs> but even then, it's very few people, unless they're psychopaths or sociopaths, but, um, and very few people, like we've got a lot of them, and <laughs> we might be able to pinpoint even where they are, <laughs> but they're not the average person, okay? The average person has been duped like we are, and they will resist. And when they say, I know about this and I don't care, often it's because they want to say something so outrageous to us that we will get off their back and leave them alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we don't walk away there and say, oh, you're a lost cause and whatever. We remember their blood has gone to the back of the brain. And even though they're trying to remain calm and go, I don't care, they're reacting. Okay, because it's a bit too strong. Okay. So when or if they say, you know, why are you making me feel so awful? Now, we can't make anybody feel anything <clears throat> without their permission. But you go ask more questions. When you say you feel awful, what do you mean? Well, I feel sick. I feel awful. This is terrible. And, um, and so what is it about what I'm showing you that is so, oh, my God, it's so awful. And so, yeah, it's awful, isn't it? It's, it's this is when we find out about this, it's a horror story. And um our job now is to become part of the solution and not partake of it. Cause, cause I always ask people, so what they go, why is this going on? So, so what do you think is a why of course, but they might've asked that question. So what is it that, you know, why do you think it is that these things happen? And they go, well, I don't know. Cause people are greedy. And they go, actually it's not. It's because it's when we buy this, we are creating the demand. And when we stop doing it, they'll create something else. Yeah. It's not a few bad people doing it. And, um, and so very important to keep him accountable, I think. And, um, but it's something like, you know, whatever they say, they're giving us clues. I don't care. You know, when did you stop caring? Yeah. What happened to you to make you say you don't care? What do you care about? Yeah. You keep them engaged in the conversation. Oh, I don't want to look at this. I don't want to see any more. What is it you think you, if you stay here and look, what is it you think you can see? When mm -hmm. you ask them that, they have to visualize in their mind something that's happening. And that's great for advocacy at home as well. When someone goes, oh, no, I won't look at the video. And we know, gosh, if only they saw the video, they would really get it. You go, so what is it you think I'm going to show you? Yeah, it's because mm -hmm. then they've got to visualize something in their head and they're seeing some sort of cruelty. When they wince from us, you kind of got them because emotionally they've connected and they're very quickly going to try and move away from that. And we need to prod that pain a little bit so it becomes incomprehensible and impossible for them to continue their actions when they know it's wrong. It's a horror story. And emotionally, though, but their actions are still doing it. We need to not allow them to change that and go, oh, well, you know, that's, uh, I'll just get it from the humane farmers and all those sort of things. Or I only get organic, you know, grass fed or whatever. OK, so. Um, very important to have good people around us. Very important to keep people accountable, but don't, they're not responsible for everything we know and that is going on. But, you know, by MB, slowing down, if you lose your rag with them, go, whoa, I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I can't apologize for showing you this because mm -hmm. when I found out, I couldn't believe it and I was angry and I was disbelieving. However, now we can make more informed choices. Thank you so much for, for all of that wisdom that you have imparted. Uh, if folks in the chat, go ahead. What, what did you learn so far already? Go ahead and put some of those great nuggets that you've learned from Claire in the chat if you like to. And now we're going to open it up for questions. Yeah, use the Socratic method. Uh, someone commented. Oh. Summer, thank, th thank you. I mean, Amanda, thank you very much. Okay, so Q&A, put, put in the chat. Mikey, help me if I miss a question, put it a little bit lower so I don't have to scroll back to find the questions or press and click on the hand raise button if you'd like to ask a question. Anybody or a comment? Oh, BJ, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you uh, so much, Claire. I really appreciate this. And thank you, Michelle. Um, I already found some helpful things, but I'm with a religious group, a church group, and they are deciding about having food again at church. And I wrote back, they were going to have a little gathering and they had some cupcakes. And I said, well, I'll bring the cupcakes and make sure they're vegan. But they said, no, we've already bought it. And it's going to be a lot of trouble, blah, blah, blah. 
and but I could always bring some vegan ones to share but that doesn't make me not that makes me sad if I go where there's vegan ones so in group settings like that whether it's religious or other organizations um, all I could think of to do was say well I want to be on every food committee <laughs> but <laughs> that's maybe a little bit much so do you have any suggestions for when there's yeah. groups like that thank you yeah, absolutely. And thank you for your, um, you know, everything you're doing, BJ. And, you know, it's great that you're in a church group. So already you're with people that actually think there's a bigger picture to being in the world <laughs> and they want to do good things and they want to be better people. And they, you know, they, so that's important. You've already got them. They, you just need to expand their window to include animals. Okay. And speak to people in a language they others understand. And if you know the, the Bible or whatever, there are lots of phrases in there that you can throw back at them. You know, I love the one, you know, God's made, you know, um, giving us dominion over the animals and go, you're absolutely right. Well, there you go, they say, and say, you know, but if you actually go back to the original interpretation, the meaning dominion, do you know what it means? Well, it means we are higher than the animals. Actually, it doesn't. It means guardianship. Okay, so it's little things like that. You use the language and the thing that they're, you know, and just say, you know, and if you're in a conversation, it's help me out here. It's um, you're genuinely not with judgment. Can you help me out here? You know, one of the commandments is thou shalt not kill. And I'm a little bewildered because so much part of what we do, even though you're not doing it, is, you know, we are killing other sentient creatures for, for us when it's not necessary. How do we align this with our Christian values? You see what I mean? You're, you're yielding, you're you know not telling them they're wrong you're actually asking for expansion and and if they say something like you know yes but god's made us and go well that doesn't sit well with me that kind of doesn't sit that doesn't make sense to me you know just because you know you've got the elder in the church saying something like that um and i wouldn't say can i bring vegan cupcakes i would you know it depends on your history with them because they will have a connotation of vegan and often it's a food category <laughs> it's not to do with that's right it's uh and say, I'd like to, um, I'd like, can I, if I can bring some cupcakes that actually, you know, haven't included that animal, pro, animal, animals, I don't say animal products these days, animals in them, and they've had to lose their lives for it, surely that would be great Thanksgiving for everybody. Yeah, it's that sort of, and they're going to feel uncomfortable and they do, but you've then got the advocacy in, okay? Um, it's very challenging. I remember um, getting a, one Christmas getting from the local parish church a thing in the door we'd love you to come and have a sausage sizzle barbecue to celebrate Christmas you know <laughs> heckles go up and I wrote a long letter to them and I said it's great what you're doing you pull the community together it's wonderful and yet you know for us to make real informed choices about truly wanting peace on earth we need to be fully informed and we can't just have that for some we need to look after our brothers little younger brothers and sisters which are all sentient beings and i would be more than happy to accompany you in watching this documentary just so that you know you can also share with your parish the importance of this i didn't get an answer but that person couldn't unknow what i said <laughs> but you never know at some stage they might remember that letter i sent them when someone else just pushes them over the edge <laughs> she actually didn't become this thank you so the next person with a question is Paige. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. Um, hi, Claire. So hi, I have some family members who, you know, I wrote in the chat, uh, are doing their part by reducing and they've seen enough, they've heard enough, you know, they know about it and they've made their choice. They're not going to uh, make any shifts because they you know, are doing their part by reducing, but it's so painful for me when I see them going out to, you know, places to eat. It's somebody very close to me. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm literally at a wit's end of knowing and I'm calm. And that person yeah. I feel like is like, oh, good. She's calm. I can go out to eat six times a week now. Um, That's right. Eat the dead animals. So I'm going like, I feel like there's part of me that's dying inside me going like, no, I want to be screaming every time. And I'm trying Absolutely. to be calm, but it's upsetting. It's this constant roller coaster. So I just didn't know what suggestion. Mm -hmm. That reductionist argument's an interesting one, isn't it, Paige? It's like, 
you know, how much cruelty can you take, guys? You know, this is really what we're doing. You know, it, we can't be half pregnant, can we? And I often say that to people is when they talk about reducing. Um, reducing, I think separating the argument from let's how do we change behaviors and find out what to eat is very difficult, though. I'm actually going to make some reduction and then I feel I'm OK. I'm in alignment with my values. We've got to bring them back to that thing is they've already made some change. So instead of saying, well, why aren't you making the rest of it? Ask them, uh, what if I can just ask you a question? You said you reduced, and then that's great. What is it that made you reduce? All right, get them back to the reason they did it. Do they do it, did it to please you? Or because they don't want so much cholesterol in their diet? Or, you know, they, oh, well, you know, it's, it's all what you gave me and whatever, and go, so, okay, it's, if I hear you right, you're happy to reduce it. How has that changed how you feel about the reason you did it? is because these animals are suffering or you see what I mean? You keep bringing them back to this. You want them to be uncomfortable. So Paige, if you said that to them, you know, um, what, what was it that made you reduce? What do you think they'd say? To please me. <laughs> to please you and go, oh, well, you know, um, that's bewildering. Why would you want to please me about this? Because it's, you know, reduce a meal. You see, how do you feel about what I showed you? Okay. Oh gosh, that was awful and whatever. So if you then put them back, they've seen things. Have they seen video footage? Yes. They have. Okay. And go <laughs> help me out here. I'm struggling. You saw the video footage. And um, how do you feel about that? Is, is it okay to do this? What would they say? It only happens in other countries or not that much here. Animals okay. on the planet to be consumed by humans. That's right. And go, do you know, there was a time I thought that too, that it only ever did that. And then I did my homework. So there was a time I thought that too is very powerful. In other words, we're all in this together. We've all been duped. I, time I believed that too. Um, and I thought it only happened somewhere else. And then I did my homework. And what I showed you is systematized, industrialized, legal practice, which is happening in 99% of um, where they produce you know, meat, eggs, fish, and chicken um, and milk. Um, well, animals were there for, what makes you say that? What, what, what? Keep, what gets information? When they answer you, they have to get an image in their head and they have to, don't do all the heavy lifting, in other words. Get them to do it, okay? You don't, the more we tell people, they'll just resist. So what is it that, so it only happens in other, okay, so if you were to find out it happened here, how would you feel? You were to find out that 99% of where your food comes from is contributing to that. What would you do? You see what I mean? Keep going back to the mm. imperative of what they've done. You know, it's, um, oh, you're just preaching to me, Paige. And I heard a lovely response to this the other day, Michelle. It's, uh, um, um, if you, if, if, if we, if we can pay for animals to be pushed and forced into a gas chamber, then the least I can do is make people aware of what is happening so they can make better choices. They took the actual words the person said, and that's a good tip as well. Mm -hmm. And um, but don't give up on them. It's um, and little things like that is so, you know, and and then go back to them. Is hey, look, I find it really difficult. I want to cry every time you tell me this. Well, you don't have to come with me. The fact that I know you do it, and you're an otherwise brilliant, lovely person. I know you don't want to be part of this. How come you say it's not okay, and yet you do it? You know. And they might resist and they might struggle because they're trying to justify not having to feel the ridicules, irritation, non-compliance that, you know, we've, we've actually stood up against. Good luck. Please keep going. I will just say, by the way, is on my website, vegan, um, veganpsychologist.com, there is a free 30-day training called Vegan Voices. Okay? And that is many little videos on how to have the typical conversations. You know, what do you do when we're going around for Christmas? It could be Thanksgiving. You know, what do you do when they say animals will overrun the world? They've given us dominion. All the typical things. There's 30 days of training on there, little, in little snippet uh, parts with writing as well that you can expand your repertoire and build on that. Okay, great. I was putting your uh, website in the chat there, veganpsychologist.com. Next with a question is Ronald. Ronald, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Ronald. Ronald, are you there? Maybe his hand is up accidentally. So we're going to go to the next, which is watchdominion.com. Go ahead and unmute. Hey, uh, thanks, Michelle. And uh, thanks, Dr. Claire. 
really awesome presentation. Really enjoy hearing you speak. My question is about uh, managing my own uh, emotions and I'm dealing with either, either trolls or how not to get triggered with people who are at, on purpose want to you know, trigger you with either um, boot camp style of questioning or just having every obstacle or argument uh, against your yeah. prayer for compassion. Thank you. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It sounds if you watch that documentary, which is a great one, by the way, in the church situation, is say, hey, I've kind of got this great documentary. Can we watch it and then go through it? And Perfect Compassion is perfect for that, isn't it? So speak to them in the language they understand. Um, but you mentioned trolls, and so I imagine that there's also, um, this is happening online, okay? When we see such outrageous things and they come back very, very quickly, I want to remind us all that is not always a person who is a regular member of society. There are paid trolls by the meat, dairy, fish, testing it labs and industries that get paid to do this. Okay. And so you could have someone on there and they may be a person who doesn't care, or they may be someone just trying to feed their family and they're just trying to give their paid jobs and paid work is they will be forced to be Asian provocateurs and do that. So number one, I, that's one way I actually get with, um, with what I'm saying is, is number one. So don't think there's this horrible, you know, whole society out there that is being so vile and mean in care because most people will be affected by what they know is they're often put in places to do this. Okay. But you do have those other people. And so how do you manage your, you know, it is difficult. I am um, social media is set up to get reactions watch any of the documentaries like Plugged In or Social Dilemma, they have literally been developed for behavior modification, to get people fighting, to get people interacting and hanging on in there because then sell more advertising space and everything else. So there is, social media is often not the best place to do this. Often, what I, I was taught this by um, a dear friend of mine, John Oberg, who um, is you probably, many of you might know him as an, an advocate. He's done a lot for the, work for years in that reach at the Humane Society, you know, activist vegan way um, and he said the lovely thing is is you have a bit of a reaction you're going backwards and forwards you try to share the information they say something outrageous and say the reality is is um if i'd say make, make a statement like you know if it is absolutely not essential for our survival and it causes suffering it is morally indefensible for us to use animals in any way okay that's all i'm going to say on it and i'll let you have the last word OK, because people want the last word, but you've then kept face and you're not sort of giving in, so to speak, and then draw the line underneath it. Also, other people will look to you because you're showing leadership. You know, you're sort of calm, but you say what needs to be said. And then you say, and I'll let you have the last word. And people love that because if not, it'll just go backwards and forwards forever. So managing your emotions is slow your breathing down, that positive self-talk, which is so important. Um, there's a meditation also on my um, website and there's fabulous resources on AAM to, you know, is realize that your blood's whipping to the back of the brain. It's anger, it's anger as much as anything and injustice and outrageous unfairness is because something you believe in, common decency and not wanting to cause harm is being violated. All right. So slow your breathing down. Imagine this parasympathetic nervous system is bringing your, you, know, you down to calm, bringing your blood to the back of the brain, take a deep breath, say what needs to be said, walk away. You know, you, they're just wanting to win an argument and agitate. Mm. So difficult. Mm. Thank you for that question. And on to the next with uh, Elizabeth has your hand, her hand raised. You can unmute yourself, Elizabeth. Hi, can you hear me? You can. Yes. Okay. So my question is, I have a 10 year old stepson um, and he's not vegan. And I have a hard time getting through as far as having him try new foods. He understands the vegan standpoint because his dad has been vegan for five years and I've been vegan for three years, but his grandma raised him um, pretty much all the way up until I'm 10 years old. And so the most challenging part is he he gets the idea, but it's really hard to get away from those foods. He's really used to like um, microwave food. So it's a challenge to get him to even try healthier foods. You know, this is so difficult, isn't it, Elizabeth? Is, um, number one, his father and yourself are great examples to him. Is there is, you know, physically, there's a high addictive factor to that. 
the microbiome in our stomachs is literally people come off meat or something and they do that and they go oh, i feel terrible yes you do because you know your microbiome are used to having this diet and you will feel strange partly by toxing and everything else and so there's an addictive quality to that he's been brought up by fast foods and microwaving so we given that there is probably a, some physiological dependence on there um, he's, he's young enough to think about role models is another one. If he's got a good relationship with his father, father can be a great example there, is perhaps align some, make that segue in to, you know, may well be the vegan burger to start with. Okay, shifting him to that, maybe not even telling him. And then going, uh, but then coming clean with him afterwards, of course, is actually <laughs> giving him this thing and going, this burger, and he goes, do you enjoy that? Yeah, that's no, great, and whatever. It's... Um, and um, actually, that was um, plant-based burger. Oh, I didn't like it then. Actually, that's not true, isn't it, Dave? Come on, let's, you don't know you liked it. Um, so you, you move them into that because the associations with that would be one thing. Um, you know, it really, he needs to eat more fresh and healthy foods. Find out what he likes. Does he like lasagnas? Does he like curries, like burgers? And veganize them as, as much as looks and feel and texture that is like what he's used to and segue him in then to actually more of the whole foods around it. Um, but if dad can be the lead, the lead on this, that would be great as well. Um, but, you know, there's also a 10-year-old kid. He wants to be like his friends. He wants to go to the burger mm -hmm. place or whatever. We're up against so much, aren't we? It's never just the food. <laughs> it's the whole social yeah. context. Um, so that would be my advice in, in, in the beginning and, and that role model. Um, if you've got some other kids in that age group, you know, bite into something there where they eat this different types of food. So it's not just the grown up, so to speak. It's, it's cool to do this stuff, you know, which uh, well, I, we have a, a routine. So I cook at home and I cook yeah. only vegan and his dad, to, so he doesn't feel so just restrictive. Um, his dad will allow him to have non-vegan food outside the house. So we try to balance that out. And I guess the only thing he does like right now is a vegan chicken noodle soup that I make for him. Yep. So he's open to the idea. It's just, it's only been four months since we started the transition. Is there like a time frame of like breaking the addictive food from his body, like what he would be craving? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, as long as he's still eating those foods to a large extent, that will be an addictive sort of thing, I guess. And I'm not a nutritionist, but there's no shortage of information on this. So nutritionfacts.org would be great. There's 2000 videos on there. You could probably search on that or, you know, different vegan outreaches. And, and I'm sure at AAMM as well, we probably could post some things there, which would be. Um, so already he likes that. So he's not against the ethical side, is he? Or he's just he's trying to keep in routine. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know, in one sense, we probably think, oh, it's unfortunate that dad allows that. But, you know, dad will lose the argument that he's brought, if the kid has been brought up to eat like this, you know, suddenly he's kind of, as a young person, suddenly been told everything we've taught you is kind of wrong. So it's very difficult, isn't it, then to segregate him and, and suddenly say, you've got to change because we've been, you know, you've given him, you've expanded his choices as you're getting older. Um, you know, it's a real challenge. So the more you can make delicious food similar to what he's having, you know, I'd start with that sort of stuff to start sort of thing. Ask him, what is it like about the chicken noodle, chick, chick like noodles sort of thing. Um, but is there a time? Um, ultimately, at this age, it's probably now he's embedded with those values and things in the same way that the plant based good would be the same way. He wouldn't want to go, although sometimes they do, is there's a huge peer pressure as well. So if you can find some other kids around that are similar ages and they go to a big, big little vegan barbecue, and are similar to them, then they don't feel so odd that, you know, they are being asked to do something. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I wish I had a magic wand for you that, you know, we have to undo all these things, don't we, that we've all been duped to doing. <laughs> Fantastic, though, he's getting the information at 10. Imagine he waited to 35. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Jesse's saying something there. Actually, it takes 21 days to, say, change your taste buds. It almost takes, about, on average, 21 days to, to change your habit. But, you know, it's maybe 40, maybe five sometimes if it's highly emotional or not. And um, but it has to be the consistency where you're trying to change his behaviors. So the more consistency you can be in, you know, bringing stuff in that becomes standard routine when he comes to see dad. It's going to help. Thank you, Jesse. Mm. 
She's going to want to do it. That's the thing. <laughs> so we have time for. Oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. I need to interrupt you. Good. Oh no, that's fine. I was just saying thank you. Okay. We could spend Thanks. more time on this, Elizabeth. But I know there's so much. Oh, but you know you're doing the great work. So keep going and, and learn from people at AAM. You know, work work with a mentor. You know, share with other people. There'll be lots more ideas. Aw, thank you for that, Claire. A little Yay. plug for AAM. <laughs> okay, oh, so we I'm have. A, I'm a great fan. <laughs> you are. I love it. I love it. I love it. So we have time for just the last two before, because we want to give Claire a time for her uh, short guided meditation. But Shreya is up next. Go ahead and unmute Shreya. Yay. Hi. Um, thank you again for uh, doing this, Claire. I always love hearing your, um, your insights. Um, my question is more to do with uh, social media engagement with um, friends and family. Um, so, for example, some non-vegan friends or acquaintances who know that you are an animal rights activist or a vegan and are also very respectful of that. So when they hang out with you, they're like, hey, let's go to a vegan restaurant or um, I'm or like they'll cook a vegan meal for you. Like, so I, I'm fortunate enough to have some friends like that, but yeah. um, sometimes they also but they also are unapologetic about posting pictures of animal flesh products and that can be frustrating so and it's not directed at me but it's just you know maybe someone's on a trip somewhere and they're like oh look at this like beef tongue taco and it's like uh, it's just so disturbing to see that and yeah sometimes I can just mute the their posts so it doesn't bother me but a part of me is also like should I use that as an opportunity to do, do some activism or is that pushing a friend who is, um, you know, being respectful um, away? How would, how does one navigate those kinds of situations? Cause I, I feel uncomfortable do like just sitting back and not saying anything and just muting them or, yeah. or, um, I mean, I, I feel, I think, you know, the fact that I do have vegan animal rights activist friends, I don't, I don't feel as bad about, you know, quote unquote, losing a friend um, with who I might not be as close to point being, I think it's going to be a little more complicated if it's someone I was really, really close to, but um, yeah, just how to navigate uh, social media spaces. Is it a, is it an opportunity to do activism and say something like, oh, I wonder if there's a, um, if or like, hey, did that restaurant have any like plant based versions or something like that? Just your thoughts of how to sure. navigate that. Thanks. That's right. Absolutely. Um, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I remember making a comment on somebody's um, page once because they did this. This is what I've just, you know, cooked. And to me, it was horrifying. And I'm going to say I made the mistake. I didn't make the mistake. The reaction was so out of proportion to the threat. Because in many ways she received it, she was, and she said later, you try, you know, you tried to make me feel shamed. I said, well, I can't make you feel anything without your permission. But the person felt shame. They've all they've done is, I've had this lovely meal, da da da. To them, it's a meal, it's a great time, holiday memory. We're going to hit them with something else because I, they said that, and I, I did something back that actually said, you know, um, I'm glad you had a great time, a great meal. However. You know, there is a way to have exactly what you've had and no one has to suffer. Here's a link to Animals Australia, Pigs Can Fly, you know, whatever. Whoa, the reaction was huge because I think it's shaming and I think it's embarrassing. And it's person said, where are you coming from? And because it's social media and that is set up through to actually get that reaction. I would. So if you're going to use it as a form of advocacy, there's a bit of caution there unless they're actually asking you directly or they make fun. Oh, the vegans wouldn't like this. Then they've given you permission. OK, so if they say something like that is um, and go, well, um, no, the vegans wouldn't like this. Um, and not because it's someone chooses something else is because they know what goes into it. And the lovely thing is you can have exactly that sort of tacos with slightly different ingredients and no one has to suffer. But that's when they gave you permission. They prodded you. I would actually take it offline and send them a personal message and go, hey, I saw uh, there was something you posted the other day on um, Facebook. I wonder, can we have a quick call about that? Because I just want to share with you my reaction to that and why I didn't comment. And then you take it offline because then the person's with you. They're not shamed in front of their, all their friends and they feel they've got to say something for all the non-vegans. 
All right. So that's personally what I would do. I think we don't, you know, we're on a relay race here. You, you give snippets of information. You say something, then Janine says something, and Dave says something at work. Then they see Uncle Bill had a heart attack and he changed his diet. All of this is like a, we're passing on to other people. Sometimes we don't get to see the outcome of their change, but one day they will. Uh, we have to play our part. So for you to, and I, I would avoid this, hey, were there any vegan options there? Move away. We've got to keep coming back to the ethics. Okay. And um, because else it makes people feel warm and fuzzy. Oh, you know, you're just a person that wants has got a fussy diet. OK, it's and I love that one. Then, Michelle, we've talked about this. I love that one. It's I respect your values. You should respect mine. And I say to people, I don't mind if you respect my values or not. That's not what I'm interested in. What I want you to do is through your actions, respect the right of that animal to be not harmed in any way and to be used for us. So I move it. See, I've used the words. But it's really irritating, isn't it? It's like, you know, I, I really, you're such a better person than me, Michelle. You know, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. But I like that one is we can have exactly the same guys and no one has to suffer. Straight back to the end and the ethics. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, I, I totally get the whole social media thing. I can remember once oh. I posted on um, Oprah's, like I commented on her post, like she had... Um, you know, chicken bodies during a uh, Fourth of July celebration, and I was like, um, uh, "Like, it looks like you all had a lovely time. I hope the chickens could also enjoy the kind of freedom that we are celebrating." And then, man, the people came for me. Like, I yeah. kidnapped their kid. Like, I was like, "What happened?" Yeah. They're like, yeah. "You're the really like, yeah. be, be vegans. Like, you are the reason why no one likes yeah. vegans." Blah 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 blah. And I was like, "Whoa." okay that's right so actually you, know. you did nothing wrong you did it oh i know <laughs> what a great and that, that you didn't know that but actually you pressed a button if they didn't respond they go who cares you got to them but you didn't do it with aggression and tell them they're terrible people and all those reactions some of which will be trolls other people will be going mm, i don't feel comfortable about that but they won't say it okay so you know truth is like a lion when we put just put it out there and it defends itself so well done for what you did. You did it brilliantly. And uh, huh? yeah, it's hard though, isn't it? When we get all that, oh my gosh, I've had it myself. And you go, whoa. And people say to me, I have horrible comments. I said, I don't even read them. Okay, don't read them because they're not about you. If you've seen your integrity and you haven't caused the necessary pain to people by shaming them and telling them that it's all their fault is they are, that's their reaction to this. And it's none of your business, actually, what they think in many ways. So, you know, don't read them in many ways. It's, it's hard. You did the right thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shreya. That was a, a really good uh, conversation as well. And so I'm not seeing any more questions, but we sort of have to stop with the questions for the moment, at least because we want to make sure we have enough time for Claire to now lead us in a short guided meditation. We've talked so much about quieting our mind, slowing down and breathing. So you're going to give us an, a little taste of that, uh, an experience of that. So go ahead, Claire. Great. Lovely. Now, uh, meditation is oh, oh so important for so many reasons. It sort of expands the space between all our thoughts in many ways. <laughs> okay. And when we constantly bring ourselves back into slowing our brain waves down, you know, bringing ourselves to calm. Think of it as we're resourcing ourselves. And also when we slow our brain waves down through breathing and meditation, we know this in yoga, um, that's where insights and intuitions come from, aha moments of how to, you know, oh, this is what I need to do. Okay. And we're constantly putting that credit back in our emotional and, and physical banks. Okay. So um, I'm going to get you to close your eyes and I'm actually going to close mine too. As I'll be looking at everybody. <laughs> okay. Now just notice when you close your eyes, how the world changes. Okay. It's you are brought to the inside and most of us have busy minds. And so as I'm doing this little short meditation, it's highly likely that your mind will wander. But just gently bring it back and become observant of what you're doing. Okay. And then just become aware of your breathing without doing anything to it at the moment. For most of us, it's pretty shallow. Okay, so as you become aware of it, I just want you to deepen that breath. And then 
and just start to deepen that. And in the moment, I'm going to get you to breathe into the count of four, okay? But just become aware of it. And just imagine it's coming up from the bottom of the stomach and we're going to start counting. So breathing in, one, two, three, four, out through your mouth, five, six, seven, eight. Breathing in through the nose, one, two, three, four, like a waterfall coming out your mouth, five, six, seven, eight. Breathing out through the body, up to the chest, breathing out. Just notice how something changes when we do that. Powers in our breath to bring ourselves, to slow ourselves down. Let's bring that breathing in. Okay. And then just become aware um, of the sort of space, I guess, behind your chest. Just bring your attention to that sort of area. And then breathe into that area. Breathing in. And breathing out. And then bring your awareness to the space around your throat. Notice with your, in your mind's eye, you just draw your attention there. Almost breathe into it and breathe out. And every time we focus on a different part of the body, just imagine it's letting go. Just observing. The mind wanders, bring it back. And then to become aware of the space around your eye, just behind your eyes. See how your attention goes there. Breathing in and breathing out. And then to the energy of space around your head and around your eyes. Breathing in and breathing out. And then without opening your eyes, draw your attention to about a, a couple of meters outside of your body. Just bring your mind's eye, imagine this outer sort of awareness. We can do this. We bring our attention to the space around our bodies. Breathing in and breathing out. Bring your mind back all the time. And then to wherever you're sitting, to the, bring your energy and awareness to expand to the size of the room. Breathing in and breathing out. Bring your mind back to awareness. Noticing that when you bring your attention out to there, it's almost as if the, you know, the, the kindness, the gentleness is expanding to the room. And then expand it a little bit further to the town you live in. Little visual cue, a little technique we can do. Breathing in, just imagine expanding way out. And breathing out. And then expand it out to encompass the whole world of our notion this beautiful planet and all the people that are on the call to be encompassed in that. Breathing in, breathing out. Just bring that awareness to through our attention. And then we bring that back in to our time. Breathing in and breathing out. Into the room we're in. Breathing in and breathing out. Taking our busy mind to just bring it back to our breathing into that little bubble around ourselves. Bring it into the energy of space behind your eyes. Breathing in and breathing out behind our throat. Behind our chest bone. Breathing in, breathing out. Just where our attention goes each time letting go a little bit more. And then most importantly, I just want you to bring that breathing. So you're breathing up through the body. And you breathe down and out. And this time on the in-breath, in a moment, I'm going to get you to breathe through the left side of your body. So you're breathing in, it comes up left through where our heart is. And then we breathe back, back in through the heart. So you breathe into the count of four, up through the left. One, two, three. Or it's going through the heart. And then when we breathe back, we breathe back through the heart. Five, six, seven, eight. Just, include, just do that for a few moments. Up through the heart. Just imagine it visually. Down through the heart. It's a very powerful technique called heart maths. Direct your attention when you write a meditation to them. Breathing up through the heart. Down through the heart. Keep that going. 
And then I want you to imagine now as you're breathing in and breathing out, the heart is expanding and contracting. So it's nice as breathing in, it expands, breathing out, it contracts. But that, that air, the breath is moving through the heart. There's something very magical about doing this. There's memory type cells in the heart that register our reactions well before the brain registers them. Expanding, contracting. And as you're doing that, in a moment, I want you, when you expand, I want you to expand it out to, 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 to literally pass love to someone you care about, whether it's someone you want to advocate to. Breathing in and breathing out through the heart, expanding, contracting. And on the expansion, we're giving it out to someone else. Maybe a um, non-human animal you share your life with, but maybe your neighbor, someone you want to advocate to. Expand that love to them and bring it back to your heart. Expand it. Your heart. Very simple little technique. Just feel that little bubble around them. Energetically, it actually makes a huge difference, as all the research on heart mass shows us. We energetically shift the energy around others. Science is catching up with us a little bit of common sense here. Breathing in and breathing out. And then just in the interest of time, we bring it back into the awareness of breathing up through the body and out through the body. And I want you just to bring into your mind's eye a vision of a vegan world, a vision of a world where cruelty is something people have to ask what it means. For every living sentient being, including Mother Earth, there is kindness, compassion, no harm, expansiveness, joy, abundance. But we're breathing there. And just imagine that day, the vision of the future we want to create. Just imagine yourself in your mind's eye. You could see yourself talking to another person, laughing, joking. Okay? You're not worried about a paycheck because there's abundant work. Everyone's contributing their skills and graph. There's community. There's laughter. There's health. There's abundance on our planet. Have a vision for a future we want to create. Breathing in and breathing out. And most importantly, use our neuroscience friend. I want you to imagine the emotions you feel when you see yourself in that world and in that life. And then I want you to teach yourself emotionally what it feels like to be in that future right now. Teaching your very cells, a neural memory of what we are heading for. It's the present becoming the, the future. We need to visualize that and see what it is. But instead of waiting for one day, we look around and it's here, we can create it right now by teaching your body emotionally what it feels like to be in that future now and grasp that beautiful feeling of abundance and ease and kindness and, and care and creativity and joy. Take that back with you to your everyday life and keep it like a little jewel in your heart. In the interest of time, to keep that in your memory. Bring it back into your body, back up through your heart. Take some deep breaths. Notice there's a shift in your energy just by the breathing and the action. And elect to, to learn to meditate. There's lots of ways we can teach you to do that. So become aware, and when you are ready, just come back into the awareness of the room. And when you are ready and not before, you can open. Okay, great. Everybody back? That was wonderful, Claire. Thank you so much for that. If you have, let us know how you feel following that meditation. Go ahead and let us know how you feel in the chat. Um, and any takeaways you want to put in the chat from our time together tonight with Claire Mann, author of Vistopia. And Claire, do you have a couple of final words? Because then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap us up. Absolutely. So I mentioned a technique there called heart mass. Go and have a look at that, heartmass.org. 20 years of scientific research showing us that it's, science is catching up with common sense, that actually there's a reaction in our heart before the, there's memory type cells similar to the, the head, and it registers there first. So it's getting into our heart, and, and that's the connection we're making with other people. Um, 
please check out Vegan Voices. Um, also, there's a companion to Vistopia, of course, called um, Myths of Choice, Why People Won't Change and What You Can Do About It, looking at all the things we've got there. And so there's a free course there as well, veganpsychologist.com forward slash myths, M-Y-T-H-S. You can tap into that to start to look at the underpinnings of why people are so resistant, most importantly, what we can do. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for each of you, all the activism you're doing. We are on the right side of history. Okay, and we can't be complacent. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So, but also treat other, not human animals, you know, in the same way we want to treat our sentient beings because we're all, we need to, life is sacred and we need to, to bring that into our awareness. So um, I hope that was helpful to you. And keep going, please do. <laughs> Can you put those websites in the chat, Claire? Yes, of course. That would be wonderful. Folks are asking and, and would love those. Okay, so while you're doing that, yeah, I want to also thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. And thank you, Claire, for your time and wisdom. Thank you to Mikey for working the technical end of our event, which we couldn't do without. And a, an announcement of our upcoming workshops. Our next workshop is on this Tuesday, November 9th. It's a workshop on uh, Kaporos, Effective Activism during Kaporos, featuring vegan Rabbi Gersh. Thursday, November 18th, we're having a workshop investigating and documenting evidence of animal cruelty and illegal activity. Tuesday, December 10th, sorry, Tuesday, December 7th is our workshop, Cubes and Squares, Footage as Street Activism. And we're planning our workshop calendar throughout the year, many more workshops to come. So we certainly hope that you'll continue to join us. And once again, if you're interested in becoming a mentor or a mentee, or just want to get more information or get more involved, please reach out to any AAM mentor or visit our website. Mikey might put those in the chat, our socials and our website, uh, Animal Activism mentorship.com and follow AM and farm on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube and Clubhouse. And this, the recording of this workshop will be uploaded probably in the next 24 to 48 hours. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search for animal activism mentorship on YouTube. Okay, does that sound terrific? Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Claire, for being with us so, so much. And thank you, everybody. And go vegan. Do I have to say that? No. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I usually say that when I, when I have to. Not today. <laughs> oh, exactly. It's lovely to be amongst your own tribe.